So thank you everyone for um, joining us for our virtual edition of the Gorilla Lit Reading Series. Uh, Dixon Place is a nonprofit organization that fosters artistic community in New York City, and they have generously supported our reading series for many years now. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the theater and lounge have been closed since March 13th, but they've been creating a wonderful lineup of virtual programming, which you can check out at dixonplace.org. Uh, we also wanted to share that Dixon Place is now certified to accommodate media production. So if anyone here is interested in that, they welcome inquiries and you can go to their website to uh, find out how to contact them. <clears throat> Dixon Place began as a literary salon in 1985 and continues that work today with the Gorilla Lit Reading Series and many other literary programs. Uh, their box office and bar usually cover much of their budget, but months of closure since the pandemic means that their programming is, is being sustained solely by donations. So uh, please consider donating. We'll put a link in the chat window. Um, anything you, at all you are able to give is very much appreciated. And with that, I will welcome um, our host, Lee Matthew Goldberg, who will introduce our readers. Um, Lee. Great. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming out or joining uh, our Zoom Google reading series. Uh, we have three great readers for you today. Um, and so let's just begin, why don't we just start? Um, Melissa Falaveno is the author of the debut essay collection, Tomboyland, the former senior editor of Poets and Writers magazines. Her essays and interviews have appeared in Esquire, Paris Review, Bitch, Miss Magazine, Literary Hub, Prairie Schooner, Diagram, and Midwestern Gothic, among others, and received a notable selection in Best American Essays 2016. She has taught nonfiction writing at Sarah Lawrence College and Catapult in New York City, and is the 2020-2021 Kenan, Kenan, Kenan Visiting Writer at UNC Chapel Hill. Born and raised in small town Wisconsin, she lived in Brooklyn. Please welcome Melissa. <laughs> Did we lose Melissa? Melissa. <laughs> oh no, we lost Melissa. Melissa is coming right back. She's getting fully ready. <laughs> you really built suspense. It was bound to happen, right? Technology. It was bound to happen. Um, She's joining yeah. right now. Hold on. Here she comes. <laughs> And she's back. Welcome, Ooh. Melissa. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Had a little Wi-Fi trouble here. All right. Did I miss the introduction? You did. I, I read your bio. That's okay. great. <laughs> you came right back afterwards, so we're all good. Okay, perfect timing. Okay, can everyone see me and hear me okay? Great, all right. Sorry about that hiccup. Thank you so much for having me tonight. It's such a pleasure to be here um, with this stellar lineup um, and to see so many familiar faces. I'm so excited. Um, so I'm going to be reading from my debut essay collection, um, which I, I'm imagining Lee mentioned, but um, just in <laughs> case, uh, <laughs> this came out about two months ago, a little over two months ago. Um, it's an essay collection about um, gender, class, the Midwest. Um, it's personal essays. It's a little bit of reportage, cultural reportage, interviews. Um, and I've been doing readings for like two and a half months. And um, this is my last reading on the books for a little while. So I was like, what am I going to read? Um, and I kind of went back and forth, and then I figured that it made sense to, um, to, for my last reading, start at the beginning, read the oldest essay 
in this book. So um, I've been, I was working, I worked on this book for about 10 years. Um, so this oldest essay, um, I think I started drafting in, in 2010, maybe even earlier, maybe 2009. Um, and it is an essay about moths and a moth infestation. Um, it's also about solitude and isolation, and loneliness, which I feel like we're all sort of struggling with a little bit these days. Um, and then this morning I saw a moth in my bathroom. Uh, um, and I'm coming to you from Chapel Hill right now, and I'm alone. Um, away from my, my family, my home in Brooklyn right now. And I was like, okay, so this is a sign. I have to read this piece. So I'm going to read from this essay. It's called Of a Moth. Um, and here we go. It has an epigraph. And the epigraph is, but life is vigorous. The body lives. Virginia Woolf, night and day. For some months now, my apartment has been infested, not with bed bugs or cockroaches or silverfish, those slick, sickly creatures that have plagued apartments of my past and the apartments of so many in this huge, sprawling city by the sea, but with moths, small, crawling, fluttering things whose full-grown bodies look strikingly like butterflies and whose larvae look devastatingly like maggots. The moths live not in my linen closets or dresser drawers where one might expect them to live, nor in my curtains or clothes hamper. I do find them in these places sometimes, when I draw back my curtains on a rainy morning or when I pick through a pile of sweaters on my bedroom floor. In a billow of dust, they flutter out, frenetic and wild, their wings flapping frantically as they attempt to figure out where they are. But the moths don't, do not make their home in these places. Instead, they've built a settlement in my pantry, in the dark, narrow hallway connecting my bedroom and kitchen, its long row of cabinetry housing foods deemed non-perishable. The tile of my pantry floor is cracked. The old cupboard doors creak when they close and fall open on their own. Some hang askew from rusted hinges. All are painted white, but chipped down to wood. For months now, the moths have made this dark passage their home. At first, I tried everything I could to get rid of the pests. I cleaned obsessively with a cocktail of industrial strength poisons. I purged open food months or years old. Upon discovering a commune of tiny writhing larvae that had somehow made their way into a tin of almonds, I flung each of the eight pantry doors open took every edible out of its cardboard or plastic packaging, dumped out and then sealed the contents up tightly in glass jars, cookie tins, and the few remaining Tupperware containers whose warped lids still fit snugly. Pasta in mason jars, cereal in large plastic bins, row, rows of new shiny sarcophagus-like storage for my food. I was convinced that the moths and the worm-like creatures that precede them would be unable to chew through these tightly sealed tombs, that they would starve and die, and I would be left alone again. When the moths first arrived, I had been living on my own for a little over a year. After having lived with a partner, by all accounts, a man I would have eventually married for five. We'd broken up, and I had moved across the country, leaving my family, my home, and the community I'd built for myself over the previous 10 years. I gave away most of my things, packed a few boxes and bags into a car, and drove from my small Midwestern city to New York, that hallowed glittering metropolis on the coast, with the goal of starting over. The man drove with me, one last long farewell. We spent two days together on the road. He got me settled into my new place, and then I watched him drive away. He would return to our small city, to our home, to our shared friends and community, and I would be left alone. I stood on the curb and waved, and he waved back. Then he turned a corner and was gone. I'm someone who leaves quickly, and while I'd like to say I don't look back, the truth is that of course I do. I moved into a crumbling little house in a crumbling neighborhood with a set of strangers, they were nice enough, my new roommates, but I kept mostly to myself. I worked, cooked, and ate alone. I shut myself inside my bedroom, eating bowls of canned soup on my bed, 
reading by lamplight, and eventually putting myself to sleep with a glass or two of whiskey each night. For the first time in years, I knew solitude, and I wanted nothing more. A year later, I moved into a second apartment with a new set of strangers, and we tried at first to be friends. But just a month or two after we moved, moved in together, our interactions became increasingly diminished. It seemed in those days, by early fall, we existed only in one another's peripheries, living under the same roof, ostensibly together, but in reality floating in and out of an empty house, utterly alone. This was more my doing than theirs. Most days, I left the house, came home, made a quick dinner, then disappeared into my room with it. I'd emerge only when I had to, choosing times when I heard silence in the kitchen to sneak back out. Crusted bowls and mugs collected on my dresser and nightstand. Anyone who has lived for a time with a lover and then suddenly did not will understand what I mean by those crusted bowls, by those solo whiskeys, by the promise of solitude behind a closed door. That to be tethered so intimately for so long and then to find yourself free is both misery and miracle, a sudden and unlikely dream that brings both darkest despair and the euphoria of liberation. They'll understand the daily fixations on the ideas of togetherness and separateness, the idea that humans, or at least most of us, pair off and couple up and try as best as we can to stay with one mate for the rest of our lives, fueled in equal parts by love and connection and expectation, and at the root of it, the blind hope that we will never be alone again. And this, we're told, is what we should want most, a partner, children, a family, those bound by sacrament or by state or by blood, who's, who's, who will, we believe, with everything we have in our fragile human hearts, never leave us. The moths first arrived in late October in the form of small whitish worms that had somehow, impossibly, made their blind and crawling way into one of my roommate's unopened bags of Japanese rice noodles. After much shrieking and waving of arms, fearing our apartment was infested with maggots, the first of many cleaning binges began. But it was too late. The worms, what we would shortly thereafter discover to be larva, had hatched, and dozens of small winged creatures began crawling up the dark interior walls of the pantry, flying out and circling our heads every morning when we reached for a box of cereal, every evening when we pulled out the pasta. Like some kind of nightmare, the slick things were able to squeeze themselves inside even the most tightly sealed containers, unopened boxes and bags, the firmly twisted lid of a mason jar. The moths and their larvae, it seemed, were unstoppable. And so, one dark Tuesday night, a brisk October wind setting bare branches of maples against the windows and bringing the promise of winter, the killing rampages began. As I tore through the cabinets, I thought of Virginia Woolf's essay, The Death of the Moth. I thought of the author sitting at her desk one warm afternoon in mid-September, watching a moth flutter and buzz and eventually fall to its death on a window pane. And as I thought of that moth, slowing and struggling and finally succumbing, I felt my mind separate from my body, extracting itself from what was occurring on the ground and floating up into the dusty air above me. It drifted above the cabinets to a quiet corner where wall met ceiling, where a colony of larvae had spun a vast and intricate web. From my disassociated view high in that corner, my mind wrapping itself inside that fragile white mesh, wanting to sleep for weeks inside the thick, sticky walls of my own homespun cocoon. I watched myself kill the moths. I watched as my hands smashed bodies, both winged and worm-like against the wood. I watched as I wiped the remains away, leaving streaks of brown and red on, a dirt, on dirty white paint. I watched as my body moved fast and frenetic, like the moths themselves. I thought of the pity Wolf had felt watching the moth die before her. And as I watched myself crush one last small frantic body beneath the weight of my hand, leaving a bloom of blood upon the wall, I felt the same pity, a brief surge of despair. After all, I thought, 
these tiny fluttering struggling creatures were, as the author said, little or nothing but life. One day, while sweeping up the remains of a dead moth carcass from beneath the hem of my bedroom curtain, I feel like this should have come with a content warning, sorry. <laughs> I picked up the body and held it in the light of the window. I studied his body, his angles, his shape, his design. He was compact and smooth. A light layer of fur covered his wings. He had six legs, long and sinewy, and tucked tightly beneath him. On either side of his head were the dark circles of his eyes, and from above them shot two short antennae. As I turned him over in the warm glow of the afternoon sun, I ran the tip of my pinky over the length of his wings. When a moth is at rest, one cannot actually see its body. One can see only its wings, which come together upon the moth's back and encase its small frame. If you were to pry open a moth's closed wings, you would see its torso, lean and narrow, built for flight, light brown with, a thin, with thin black bands running horizontally down its length. But with the wings closed tightly together, covering and protecting the body like a sheath, the pattern of each wing comes together to create a pattern entirely different than its individual design. Something complete, something whole. These insects, I realize, these pests, were carefully and beautifully built they were strong, live, and lovely. That day in my bedroom, my dead moth, the color, colors of his body burning bright in the sun, seemed to me nothing short of perfect. I set my dead moth down on the windowsill, the late afternoon light filtering through the glass and pooling around his body. I looked at his wings, which were stiff by then with death. How long had my small friend been dead? Days, weeks, I didn't know. But as I picked him up again, his body resting weightlessly in my hand, it was as if his once resilient frame had become a fragile shell overnight. One frail and paper thin wing, once strong enough to hold his body in the air, began to crumble in my fingers. This tiny creature, this once robust little thing who had been busy proliferating in my pantry just days before was gone now and quite literally falling apart in my hand. But in that bright afternoon sunlight, the browns and coppers of his wings looked golden. Unsurprisingly, I deemed my moth he. I did what it is we always do when we speak of creatures whose sex is uncertain, of insects, birds, and animals, of dark figures behind tinted windows, driving cars that cut us off, of humans like me, for whom it's simply hard to tell. Creatures who may be one thing or another, who may be both, whose bodies, regardless, we assume the power to name, like we know them, like they're the ours to possess. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, our next reader is waiting for it to pop up. All right, all right. There we go. Our next reader is Mark Barr. Mark Barr's short stories and essays have appeared in Wisconsin Review, Poets and Writers, Necessary Fiction, and elsewhere. His debut novel, Watershed, from Hub City, was favorably reviewed by Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, and Booklist, and has been awarded the 2019 David J. Lang Langham Senior Prize in American Historical Fiction, the 2019 Writers League of Texas Discovery Prize in Fiction, and an independent publisher's Book Bronze Award for Best First Book. It was also named as one of Atlanta Journal-Constitution's 12, 12 Southern Books You'll Want to Read This Fall, and one of Nashville Lifestyle Magazine's Four Fall Reads. Mark has been awarded fellowships from Blue Mountain Center, iParts Artists Enclave, Gentel Arts, Kimmel Harding Nelson Center, Lay Colony and Yaddo. He lives in Arkansas with his wife and sons. Please give a warm welcome to Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, you know, thank you to Gorilla Lit for having me. It's great to be here with Melissa and Morgan. Um, I always enjoy a trip to New York, however virtual it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be, um, like, uh, like Lee said, my book is Watershed. Uh, 
It's a novel. It's uh, it's set largely against the uh, <clears throat> uh, against the coming of electricity to the countryside in the United States uh, in the late '30s, which is a which is kind of a big deal uh, because by and large we'd had electricity since 1900, so there was like this 30-year period um, where we had you know very different lifestyles, um, and 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 I think even more so just so much of our modern life and the comforts we enjoy are, are based on electricity. I mean, like this, this Zoom call right here and the fact that I can speak to you from Arkansas this evening, none of this would be possible with electricity. And, and, and yet there was this period of time when it was really sort of unfairly applied. And so uh, my novel takes place during that particular time as the catch up occurs. Um, it's set in a small town in Western Tennessee uh, where the federal government is building a hydroelectric dam um, and, and bringing jobs along with electricity. Uh, the story kind of centers around two people, uh, Claire, who's a, a young, uh, she's a, a mother uh, who is a housewife, who's sort of, uh, her life is upended and she is uh, sort of has to start anew and gets her first taste of uh, what work, something that, you know, work outside the home and what a career might feel, be for her. Um, and Nathan, who is an engineer who's come to town to work on the dam. And so we sort of follow their sort of twin stories uh, through the book. And I'm going to be reading, I'll read just a bit from each of them. <clears throat> All right, so this is chapter one. <clears throat> so I don't think I really need to set up anything. Claire was sleeping when the discomfort started, and it had pressed its way into her dreams before she finally woke. The taste in her mouth had gone brassy and sharp, and her middle was heavy, as if a hot stone had become lodged in her pelvis. She peeled back the sheet. Travis lay on his back, his big arms sprawled, breathing evenly. He hadn't bathed before coming to bed, and the smell of river dirt and sweat rose up from him. It took her a moment to find her shoes, and then a moment longer to slip them on, laces forgotten in her hurry. It was like the time she had had the diarrhea and could hardly hold back her insides when they took a mind to come running out. But this was in her bladder, or lower. She took down the candle she kept by the door and lit it with a match. She unlatched the door and hurried across the, door, across the dark to the outhouse. When she hitched up her nightgown and let go, the burning left her breathless. It was as if she'd been touched with a branding iron. She put a hand to herself and held it to the candle's flickering light. What was on her finger was yellowed, white, and sticky. Damn him, she said. The burning pulsed again, and she quietly swore. After the moment passed, she started back for the house. It took her shaking hands two tries to light the big lamp in the kitchen. A dim light washed the walls, and she found herself looking at Travis's rifle, leaned in one corner to a side of the fireplace. She allowed her gaze to rest on it for a moment, then turned her face away. In the, in the bedroom, Travis had shifted to the middle, middle of the bed. One sleep-flung arm lay across her pillow. Her clothes were folded on a chair, and she began putting them on. He rolled over and ran a hand through his hair. What are you doing up? He asked in a gravelly voice. She kept buttoning her dress, and he lifted his head. It's late, Claire, he said into the pillow. Come back to bed. She thought about the rifle. Her hurt was more than she could contain. When she spoke, her voice was hard. You've given me something. You brought it home. You brought it home to your wife. He squinted at her. She began to tie her shoes. And he seemed to at last realize what she was about. Don't you try it, Travis said. Claire took the lamp and went into the children's room, leaving him in the dark. She roused them each, and they sat up in their beds, covering their eyes against the light. What is it, Ma? the boy asked. The girl, naked save for her wadded diaper, began to cry. Claire handed the lamp to her son, picked her daughter up. She turned in place, realized she'd need her hands free to pack, and put the girl back down. Travis stood in the doorway, his shadow cast behind him by the lamp. I'm warning you, he said. Claire addressed her son. Pack up a couple days' worth of clothes for yourself and your sister. Get a sack from the kitchen. The boy put the lamp on the bedside table and got up. You sit down, the boy said, the father said, pointing to his, his father said, pointing to the bed, and the son did, staring. Tom, Claire said, 
I told you what to do. Go on. Tom got up again and squeezed by his father. Travis didn't stop him. Claire shushed the crying girl, began dressing her. Tom returned with a bleach-flowered sack, began taking clothes from the dresser. When he was finished, Claire took the bag from him. Take your sister now. Go wait in the car. He stared at her with wide eyes, but didn't move. Go on, Tom. Don't let me tell you twice, she said. And he picked his sister up under the arms and worked past his father once more. Again, Travis made no move to stop them, and the boy shuffled down the dark hall. When she heard her son unlatch the front door, she held the lamp so she could see Travis's face. How long have you had it? Wasn't sure if I did, Travis said. He ran a dirty nailed hand over his cowlick. How long? A week, two. The lamp in her right hand, Claire hit him as hard as she could with her left. His passive face took the slap and his own hand swung around in response and clapped her across the cheek. She saw a flash and fell against the wall. The lamp went out. In the dark, she could feel him reaching for her, down on his knees now. Claire, Claire, he was saying in a regretful voice. She pushed away the hands. He caught at her skirts, pulling her back, and she kicked once, twice, and then she was free, running down the hall. Someone had left a chair pushed out at the table, and she went right over it, knocking her breath out when she fell. She could hear him coming down the hall, and she forced herself up. The boy was on the front porch waiting for her. Get in the car, she said, pushing him off the porch. Behind her in the house, she could hear Travis calling. When she got to the car, her daughter was crying again. Claire took the starter crank up in both hands and pulled it through the cycle as hard as she could. The engine came alive and she got behind the steering wheel. As she turned the car around, the headlights swept the house, showing Travis, his unkempt hair, his grubby underwear, framed in the front doorway. She gained the road with a bump and pressed the gas, even as a piece of her realized that Travis had never come farther than the porch. She steered the car along a dark track, or along the dark track. From the seat beside her, she could feel her son's eyes, large, searching her profile for some explanation. When she glanced over at him, the spell was broken and he spoke. Where are we going, Ma? She was asking the same question to herself, marveling at her own temerity, untested before now. Having leaped, where would she land? She was half surprised that she knew the answer, though it did anything but bully her. Grands, she said, the word like a rock in her mouth. So that's Claire, and then I'll just, I'll read a little bit of Nathan to conclude. <clears throat> um, let's see. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't think I need any sad ones. <clears throat> From what Nathan had gathered over the months after the fire, Larson had started working when he was just a kid to help out with rent at the tenement where his family lived. An accident when he was a boy had left him with an unbending left leg, but he was a hard worker and he earned a reputation for reliability. He was promoted to his boss's new commercial property downtown the one that Nathan and Lawrence's fledgling firm had just completed that spring. Nathan had envisioned 20 units in the stout four-story structure, but the new owners subdivided, squeezing in 32. The offices were cramped with doors that in some cases couldn't be opened with at the same time without striking each other. Most offices only had a single window, but Larson's employers sweetened the deal for their tenants by outfitting each office with a state-of-the-art window air conditioner. In the sultry, close heat of the Memphis summer, they were a godsend to the clerks and attorneys that worked there. Likewise to the bankers who had set up in the building's main lobby. Larson's bosses had been pleased. They paid him well, and he provided for his mother and sisters. But sometimes, in the mid-afternoon, with all the air conditioning units switched on, the overtaxed circuits, wired for 20 offices but serving 32, would fail. The lights would go out. And there would be shouts, complaints, and Larson would take his flashlight and hobble on his bum leg down the stairs to seek out the fuse box in the basement. Electrons stream down a wire like cars on a busy town road. Try to push too many through and they pile up on each other, snarl like traffic. Left with nowhere to go, 
the excess begins to escape as heat and the wires grow warm. The weak spots in a circuit, an undersized connector, a section of wire where the copper is a little less pure, these are the places where the heat shows up. Fuse boxes, by design, contain the weakest link in a safe location. But plug fuses don't come cheap, and Larson was using the box his bosses had given, given him at a steady clip. By the end of the first month of summer, he'd run out. That's when he discovered that a penny turned edgewise would fit in the fuse socket. The handles of his pliers had a coating of gutta percha. If he took up the penny with the pliers, he could just twist it in the hole. So much hinged on that moment in the basement. If there hadn't been changed from lunch in his pocket, or if he'd had bare handled pliers, it might all have been different. But that day, the lights came back on. Those, gray, those squat gray air conditioners churned back to life. Electricity will always seek out the weakest parts. When Larson replaced the first plug fuse with the solid copper of the penny, he shifted the fail point. By the end of June, he had replaced nearly two thirds of the fuses with coins and bits of scrap metal he'd found around the basement. The fire was July 7th, a muggy Memphis afternoon when every unit in the building was sucking power through the lines. A splice between the second and third floors heated up until it glowed, blackening the joists around it, then sparked white hot. The fire took hold near the stairwell, and 16 people from the upper floors never made it down. Nathan's office had been across town from the fire. He had just returned from lunch when the office boy came running to find him. His memory of the fire was imperfect. It was like his mind, quailing before the horror, had shielded itself from the whole of the thing. What remained were brief impressions of arriving late and standing amid the crowd on the street, watching the fire crews fight to save the building, seeing that it was already lost. The smell of smoke had been choking, made worse by the steam from the fire, uh, say made by the steam from the water the fire crew was spraying. The bystanders surrounded him, pressed close to see despite the thin line of police who were struggling to hold them back. Every few moments, the wind would shift and the heat and smoke rolled over them, driving them down the sidewalk, wild-eyed and coughing. With the winds changed, the crowd would press forward, taking Nathan with them. Above the mob, the afternoon sun had lost its warmth, filtered through the smoke. Everything was left dry and filmed in ashy grit. He vividly remembered the fire chief. The man had been screaming, spittle in the corners of his mouth, the veins standing out in his ruddy neck, and at his command, a group of firemen set a ladder against the blackened brick of the building's front. One, one tried to climb it to an upper window, but just as he reached the top, something gave way inside the building. There was a rumble, and black smoke began to pour with redoubled volume from the openings. The man on the ladder shielded his face, began backing down. The chief threw his helmet, cursing. He turned and met Nathan's eyes, and for a moment, it was as if he knew who he was the first prick of responsibility for this mess, for the lives of those inside, slipped in under Nathan's ribs, cold and eviscerating. In the days ahead, he would become more familiar with the sensation. Later, it was Lawrence who found him sitting on the curb, his head in his hands. Lawrence got them both to his car and took him home, neither of them fully grasping the moment's portent. Their lives' courses were changed that afternoon, though it would be weeks before they knew how profound their fall would be. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, we have come to uh, the portion of our last reader of the night. Uh, our last reader is Morgan Jerkins. She is the senior editor at Zora and a visiting assistant professor at Columbia University School of the Arts. Her debut essay collection, This Will Be My Undoing, Living at the Intersection of Black, Female, and Feminist in White America by Harper was a New York Times bestseller and long listed for the pen um, Diamonstein, I'm sorry, Diamonstein Spielvogel Award for the Art of the Essay. Her second book, Wandering in Strange Lands, A Daughter of the Great Migration Reclaims Her Roots, was published in August 2020 from Harper Books. Her other work has been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Esquire, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, Guardian, and L, among many others. Please welcome Morgan. 
Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Marco, for inviting me to read alongside Melissa and Mark. It's been an honor. Um, I am going to read an excerpt that I have not read before because I thought in the spirit of Halloween, let's talk about spirits and stuff. So I don't know how, my, how many of you are familiar with root work or root doctors, um, but when I was growing up, uh, I was taught that it was demonic. Root work is a form of traditional herbal practices for healing or hexing. And um, I grew up in a very uh, strict Christian household. It was always seen as demonic, but they always recognized its existence with reverence and fear. And I thought it was such a contradiction. And so when I traveled to the deep South, particularly the low country, South Carolina, I started to realize um, the visceral supernatural presence of it all and how, you know, Christianity and root work coexist um, and how real it is. So I'm going to read this section and I'm going to be talking about a particular group of African-Americans called the Gullah Geechee people. Um, they are said to have the highest of uh, retention rates of West African traditions. It's also said that 80% of African Americans can trace an ancestor uh, from, the, from a Charleston dock during slavery. So we all have, uh, we all are indebted to them, so to speak. So I'm gonna read this part about a very famous root doctor called Dr. Buzzard. I found that many of the famous root doctors came from the South Carolina Low Country. Many took the names of animals, Dr. Eagle, Dr. Hawk, Dr. Snake, Dr. Crow, Dr. Bug, but none of them reached the kind of international claim as Dr. Buzzard due to his extensive clientless signature tricks and showdowns with the local law enforcement. In her book, God, Dr. Buzzard, and the Bolito Man, Cornelia Bailey writes that they believed in the properties of the earth and all forms of the supernatural, God, Dr. Buzzard, and the Bolito Man. While people my age and older grew up praying to God, she says, we also believed in Dr. Buzzard, the root doctor, whom people also called the voodoo man. In the low country, God and roots were not in conflict with each other as they were in the north, where I'm from. For those who are not familiar with the terms, however, I must emphasize that hoodoo and voodoo are not the same. Hoodoo is a system of magic practices, and many of its practitioners are also Christians, like myself. Voodoo is an actual religion with loas, or spirits, deities, and veves. The word veve is pronounced in two syllables with a short e in each. It's similar to a yantra, a mystic diagram used in several several Eastern religions. Its purpose is to attract the spirits and focus the mind in interacting with them. It is believed that Dr. Buzzard put a root on Dolphusky Island off the coast of South Carolina, where I went after my time in Georgia. Dolphusky Island was home to more than 200 Gullah people until the 1980s when developers decided to make it the Martha's Vineyard of the South. They didn't know that they were building on top of a slave graveyard. The locals consulted Dr. Buzzard for help. Several of the plantations on Dolphusky Island were reconfigured into private club resort communities. One of them is Melrose. Membership fees were to start at $50,000. In 1984, there was a real estate office at Melrose Plantation that sat on top of a slave cemetery. Golf courses have been laid out over other cemeteries on the island. Locals contacted the NAACP and the Christic Institute, a public, a public interest law firm, for assistance in getting the Bellows Company developers to move the office elsewhere. A court date was set, but before the appointed time, a flock of buzzards swarmed oh. the ferry landing. The developers ended up moving the office. But developers did not give up on the land yet. Over 20 years ago, developers funded by institutional investors decided to build luxury condominiums and gated communities on Dolphuskies. But things started to go wrong quickly with what was supposed to be an exciting new resort. Um, as a result, <laughs> it was no longer profitable. Um, between the cost of losing $13.5 in impairment, they also had operating losses of $6.3 million and $6.7 million, respectively. And then the property changed hands several times. There are many locals, however, like Roger Pickney, the 11th, 
believed the downfall had Dr. Buzzer's work all over it. They believed the Melrose venture was cursed. I had emailed Pickney, a sought-after cultural historian, a month and a half earlier and was lucky enough to score an interview. He often rejected requests. Roger generally can't stand Yankees. So maybe my request was granted because I was Black. He was once arrested for protesting efforts by Saudi oil barons to build an enclave on the island. At his home, he even has a sign that says, don't tread on me, which to him means, do not displace me for further vacation property development on the island. The high priest of Dolfusky Island, Pickney is white and the author of numerous books on African-American religion and folkways. He knew all about Dr. Fusky and his root. The name Pickney is very prominent in South Carolina. There is Pickney Island, Pickney Colony, Pickney Road, and of course, Charles Pickney, the 37th governor, a member of the House of Representatives and a signer of the Constitution. Roger was brought to Dolfusky as a toddler and his father, also named Roger, a Beaufort County coroner, was partly responsible for bringing electricity there. As a child, Roger knew all about root work through his father's profession, through his father's profession, excuse me. As a coroner, Roger Pickney the 10th could not list root work as a cause of death. So instead, he would write, dead of undetermined natural causes. When it comes to the protection of him and his family on the island, Roger believes he owes that to Dr. Buzzard. For about two hours, Roger told me about this island's ways. As on other sea islands, graves would face east, but if the person of the community believed you to be a bad person, you would be put in the grave the wrong way, facing south, to be directed toward hell, or more or less the same thing to remain in the south. Nothing normal ever happens here, Roger says with a squint, not to scare me, but to underline his own inability to make sense of his environment. I surmised that if nothing is normal, it's best to lean into the strange, all of the rules enforced by the spirit realm. There's goofer dust, a mixture of graveyard dirt and other ingredients like powdered snakeskin and salt. Your intention and the time of day you collect the goofer dust makes all the difference. Dead time is between 11.30 p.m. and 12.30 a.m. If you want to do good, you collect dust from the grave of a good person and leave coins as recompense. This has to be done before midnight. After midnight, the intention is for evil, and you collect dust from the grave of a bad person. All kinds of tales circulate around the island. Cemetery watchkeepers say they see graveyards lit up like day in the middle of the night. People have experiences with ghosts, which locals like Roger just cuss out to leave them be. There are tales of buzzards hanging around developers, and there are plant eyes. Mm -hmm. At mention of the word plant eye, Roger and his wife shift uncomfortably in their seats. According to West Indian and South and Southern American folklore, plat eyes are monsters, animals with glowing eyes or spirits that can pass through gates without opening them. One man, suicidal after breaking up with his girlfriend, took a bottle of li liquor off one of the graves on Edisto Island, another one of the Sea Islands, at 3 a.m. and was found neck deep in nearby rice fields the next day. Legend has it that after he took the bottle, a plat eye took the form of his ex-lover and lured him to those fields where he almost drowned, but he survived. Roger and Amy are thankful that they have never seen a plat eye, but others have. And they say plat eyes can take the shape of anything from a horse to a two-headed dog. I'm going to jump a little bit so I can get to the good part. Um, <laughs> Dr. Buzzard was known everywhere, but St. Helena, another sea island, was his domain. His birth name was Stephanie Robertson, and he was allegedly born with a call within the amniotic sac. In African-American folklore, those born with a call are said to have psychic and healing powers. And I learned about this through a woman named Victoria Smalls. She told me that Native Islanders would see Dr. Buzzard on a boat on Chowan Creek and a buzzard would be hovering over his body. To onlookers, it appeared as if the buzzard was moving the boat against the tide. It is believed among locals and historians that Robinson's father was illegally smuggled into St. Helena from West Africa and passed his root work onto his son, who began making a name for himself in the 1900s. His most famous specialty was chewing the root. On the days of trials, Dr. Buzzard would chew a root in court in order to protect defendants from harsh sentences or guilty verdicts altogether. 
one of Dr. Buzz's descendants, Mr. Gregory, who was a third generation root worker and still alive today, who I actually contacted, helped Roger Pickney with this shut mouth special. When Pickney was in court fighting with his ex-wife over property, Mr. Gregory gave Pickney some roots for him to chew while looking his ex-wife in the eye. The call, oh, excuse me, she ended up slobbering all over herself and couldn't testify. The cost for shut mouth potion was a little over $100, which according to Pickney was cheaper than a lawyer. Dr. Buzzard's shut mouth special was so well known that eight or nine cars at a time would be parked in Dr. Buzzard's driveway, each with a different state's license plate. And so with regards to Victoria, there's something that she wanted to tell me about Dr. Buzzard and hexing. And so I want to just read this short passage that she tells me, and then I'll just conclude there. Um, it was against the law in the 1960s for interracial couples to marry in South Carolina. Victoria is biracial. Her father and her mother, her father being black and her mother being white, they traveled to Michigan and returned to St. Helena as husband and wife. According to Victoria, her parents were the first to integrate the island, but that union came with a price. You see, her father was well-loved. He stood 6'6", six, six, had a deep bass voice, and he projected a command in whatever room he entered. When his first wife died, there were many women waiting to be the new missus. But when he chose a woman outside of the community and a white one at that, the local women banded together and consulted Buzzy, Dr. Buzzard's son, another root worker. Buzzy told Victoria's father that he had some trouble coming his way. Dr. Buzzy's curse was that none of Victoria's father's sons born within the next 40 years would have a son with the surname Smalls. That's Victoria's last name. The only family member to have a son was Victoria's younger brother who became a father at 44. But the curse also claimed Victoria's son. At six feet tall and 240 pounds, her son played football, but also excelled in his academics. By the time he was in the 10th grade, he had scholarship offers from the University of South Carolina, Auburn, and Ohio State. But in the beginning of football season, during his junior year, he tore his knee and had to get surgery less than two weeks later. Percocet and morphine plummeted him into depression. Her son was living with his father, whose gun he took to end his own life. It wasn't until the very end of our trip that Victoria paused and realized that this happened before the 40-year curse was over. She pinpoints the curse happening around 1968 or 1969, and her deceased son was born in 1998. On his obituary, his last name is Jones, but he was born Julian Smalls. And so that's the way that I wanted to conclude it with talking a little bit about root work and how visceral it is to other people. And thank you for taking the time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, so what we've been doing at Gorilla um, in the era of you know, Zoom now is we've been opening up some Q&A to everybody listening and watching. Um, so if you have any questions for any of the authors, um, now is the perfect time to ask. Um, and since we don't have a, a huge, huge amount, um, you could just go ahead and ask. I don't even have to facilitate it. Or not. <laughs> I'll ask a question. Yeah. Uh, so, go ahead. Um, sorry, can I go? Or was somebody else going to go? No, you, you. Yes. Definitely. Okay. okay. Um, I was just going to ask, you know, the basic question. What, what are you all working on now? And uh, how, how are you managing, um, you know, being creative um, in these, these crazy days we're living in? Um, I'm, I'm working on fiction right now. I can't write any fiction, which is crazy because my first two books were nonfiction. I have to escape. And it kind of reminds me of how I got into writing in the first place. Um, I knew that I wanted to be a writer in high school because I was being bullied a lot. And I started to create these new worlds and characters in order to escape. And so I feel like, um, psychologically, I, I'm returning to that childlike phase, not only with writing but with the movies I write the stuff I want to eat 
it's a way of nurturing my inner child. So I'm definitely working on more fiction because the present is harrowing. I guess that's the best way to say it. I'm doing the same. I'm I'm in the same boat as Morgan. <laughs> I'm working on uh, fiction too. I'm working on a novel. Um, uh, yeah, and it's been it's been a real escape um, for me from the nonfiction. F certainly from like the really personal work um, that a lot of my book contains. So it's been really liberating to like just have like carte blanche and like oh this character can do whatever they want and, like we can we can do whatever we want with this this is so cool so um yeah i am working on one essay for an anthology that's coming out in 2022 um and that is uh an uh sort of anniversary anthology f um for uh, helen Gurley brown sex and the single girl um so Keep an eye out for that. Yeah, I, I, I think in, in this time, especially, I, I, we just gotta go easy on ourselves. I'm definitely not having anywhere near the levels of productivity I've had, you know, in past years. Um, I am working on a, a, a couple. I'm working on a novel uh, and, a, and a couple other things, but not making much progress. It's really, I don't know. And at this point, I think I've kind of resigned myself to like. The next week's probably not going to be much better. <laughs> For the nonfiction writers, do the uh, does the personal enter into the fiction? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I will say so. When I spoke about Doctor Buzzard and him being born with a call, and African American folklore said that when you have a call, you have a gift to heal or have second sight, being able to see in the past or the present. My next book um, is called Call Baby, and that's coming out in April. And what I do is I just take that folkloric element and just blow it up. And, <laughs> and, and so like, and speaking about that and how it intersects with capitalism and, and familial obligation in a gentrifying neighborhood, that is Harlem. Um, so it always intersects. Um, and that's because I think, you know, the people like me and Melissa, for example, like we do both. Like, it's just, I think it, it just, it plays into each other. Nonfiction really helps me um, because I started to write op-eds online and I really learned to strengthen my voice and fill it with urgency. But in terms of my imagination, like my mind just wanders a lot. Um, so it definitely helps to keep that balance. <laughs> Yeah, my similarly, um, this this novel that I'm working on definitely has its like roots in uh, some like the genesis was an experience that I had. So I started with that kind of like personal experience, and I just sort of started writing it down. And I didn't know if it was nonfiction or fiction. It just sort of like I wrote into that experience, and then it became clear to me that I wanted to make fiction out of it. So there's a, there are definitely a lot of um, autobiographical elements in this book that I'm working on. Um, but every time it, it seems a little too close to home, I kind of blow it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, blow it up, I love that. Um, so I have a question. Um, in We've talked about writing, obviously, during the pandemic. Have you been reading during this pandemic? Um, and is there anything that you could recommend um, as we move into winter and a lot of us will be shut inside looking for book recommendations? Fiction, nonfiction, any, anything? Oh, I'm a bit of a masochist. So I actually read Severance by Ling Ma, which is about a pandemic. I read that, I I, I read that a few weeks ago. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Like I, I, it's, it was raved about and with yeah. good reason. So. I can, I can, uh, I don't know if I would recommend it uh, if you want to escape, but I, it was a great book. Um, I would recommend Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. Very critically acclaimed book. Um, it's, it's big, but it moves fast. So I would recommend it. Uh, Temporary by Hilary Leichter um, is another one that, uh, that I would recommend. Um, those two books, Pachinko and um, Temporary, are fiction. I actually found Severance. In, it's gonna sound weird, but like, yeah, Severance is fiction too. 
it was so much worse than what we're dealing. I mean, what we're dealing with is horrible, but like that was like on another level, everybody dead horrible. So yeah, it, it was like Black Mirror. If you watch Black Mirror, yeah, it's kind of yeah. had that that type of you know infusion. It made me almost feel better about our current situation because oh, made- don't say that. Those. <laughs> I've been reading a lot, um, probably not as much as I would normally, because I do think my attention, my attention span is a little bit limited these days. Um, but I, I feel like I've been like predominantly reading novels. Um, I pick at essay collections. I'm reading, I'm slowly reading an essay collection that's coming out in March um, by Melissa Phoebos. It's called Girlhood. That's really good. She's amazing. Um, And a couple novels that I've read recently that I would recommend. um, Heavy by, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now (laughs) because I'm like, I I brought, I brought some of my, my recent favorites with me to North Carolina. So Heavy um, by Kiese Lehman is amazing. Um, I recently read a novel called Boys of Alabama by Genevieve Hudson. That's really good. If you're into like small town uh, Southern football and like gender and queerness, it's, it's a, it, that's a good one. So I'd, I'd recommend those two for sure. Heavy <coughs> is a memoir. Boys of Alabama, Al- oh. Al- Alabama is a novel. Why the, the standout book I've read in the last few years that I just always recommend to people is uh, Rachel Kushner's The Flamethrowers. Yeah. Really like that a lot. Yeah. You know, or um, Jonathan Lethem's uh, Fortress of Solitude. Those are probably my top, you know, my top couple that I always go to. I just recommended flame Flamethrowers to a student who's into motorcycles. <laughs> yeah. It's perfect for that. Nice. Do we have any other questions for our authors or just thoughts in general about writing life, whatever, whatever you want to talk about, or we could, we could end on that note. Okay. Let's, let's end. Um, so uh, a huge, huge thanks to our three great readers, Melissa, Mark, and Morgan. Um, thanks so much for um, joining us. Um, we will be back uh, November 18th uh, with three more readers. Uh, please stay tuned for um, any information about that. Uh, and thanks again for coming out tonight. And you know, hopefully back in the, sp- in the spring, we'll be, we'll be back live. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming Thank out. You. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful <laughs> evening. Beautiful work. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you.